Patrick Okrasinski. Welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Ooh, all right, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I've been following you for, I don't know, I probably discovered you maybe six or months ago or a year ago. I mean, you can't be older than like 24, 25 years old. Am I right? I'm a little bit older than that. Are you? 27. You're 27? Okay. So you're pretty relatively old compared to old guys like me at 48. You're relatively new. But um, man, when I discovered your work, I'm just floored. I mean, if you follow the podcast, you know that I've been like picking the brains of landscape painters because I really want to get good at it. And uh, when I saw your work, it just sort of made me a little bit ill because you're just <laughs> 20 something and you're knocking them out of the park. You know, uh, recently you posted um, Ocean Waves. And uh, I want to talk to you about how you pulled that off down the road, but we'll get into that. But I was just like, what is he doing? You're just freezing these waves in time on in plain air. So I'm really impressed with your work and crazy excited to have you on the podcast. So welcome. Yeah, awesome. I'm excited to get into some of that stuff. So let's start with your backstory. How did you, well, first of all, where are you residing now? And then how did you end up getting into art? Uh, I grew up in New Jersey and that's still where I live, uh, still at home. Uh, and I grew, I was born in New York city, but from a really young age, we moved out to New Jersey. I think in about like 2002, we moved out of the city. And so I was basically grew up in New Jersey for most of my life that I can remember. I've always been interested in art, I guess I could say. I've always been that kind of kid that drew a lot in school. And uh, when I was going to school, they had some extracurricular art classes and I always tried to go for those. And by the time I was in high school that uh, we got to choose an elective, I took art as an elective every single year that I could. In my senior year, I had like three art electives and I already knew to like drop out of my science and math class because I didn't need that to graduate and I just wanted to focus on doing what I wanted to do. And initially I went to study illustration, thinking about maybe becoming a concept artist or a digital illustrator, things like that. But in my sophomore year, I found some online blogs. I found Mark Delesio's blog. I ended up taking a workshop with this guy in New Hampshire that, uh, whose name is Stapleton Kearns. And that workshop in particular had a big effect on me where I was like, oh, I didn't even know this was a possibility. Like you can just make art and make a living making art rather than working for someone else, working for some studios or doing commercial work or things like that. And uh, I asked him genuinely, like, what would I have to do to be able to make that happen? And I'm thankful his answer was that uh, the most important thing you need to do is learn how to draw really well. And then he recommended either uh, Grand Central, because I was living outside of New York City, or at that time there existed a U.S. branch of the Florence Academy, which doesn't exist anymore for a few reasons that uh, it's complicated. But COVID happened and a bunch of stuff. Um, and so that school is not even there anymore. But that's the school I actually went to because it was half an hour from my house without traffic. Wow. And I was there for. So you got in there for, for that long. short period when it was there. Yeah. And wow. so I, I think it was just such crazy, stupid luck. Um, the teachers I actually had were probably, in my opinion, the best teachers that are actually teaching, you know, drawing and painting on a figurative. Jordan Sokol, Amaya Gerbpide, uh, Edmund Rochat. And those three are all now at Lyme Academy. Uh, ever since that school closed, they sort of went in and have reinvigorated Lyme Academy in Connecticut. And then uh, the other two teachers that were there, Stephen Baum and Cornelia Hearns, they ended up moving back to Norway and they have their Patreon and they're doing their thing there. Um, and but especially I got in at the right time because when I got in, all the first years would still get, uh, I, I think the biggest teacher that had an impact me was Jordan Sokol. And so when I got in the first years, he was still coming around twice a week. And then it only became once a week to the first years. And then he didn't come to the first years at all. So when I came in, even in my first year, I was getting a lot of attention uh, like from him because he was coming around to all of us. And then I could always pick his brain and he was always really uh, patient with all the dumb questions I'd ask. So 
Man, yeah, these uh, Amaya Gurpride and Jordan Sokol are two people I'd really love to get on the podcast. And uh, yeah, they're they're incredible artists. Well, all the artists you named are, uh, but those two are two of my favorites as well. So, man, you lucked out. Yeah, it was. I don't know. It was dumb luck, I guess. Uh, right place, right time, kind of. And I, I think I owe a lot to that because I think. And now as I've started teaching workshops of my own, a lot of what I teach is really more fundamental sort of stuff. Uh, how we see, how we observe, how we can translate what we're seeing into that. And so I never really studied landscape painting, even though I'm mostly a landscape painter now. Yeah. Most education was what I got from Jordan and Amaya and Eddie and Steven and Cornelia. And I just mostly figured out how does that apply to landscape painting? I guess I studied, I did that one workshop with Stapleton Kearns and another workshop with Mark D'Alessio a little bit later down the road, who's a big hero of mine. And, but then, you know, there are so many books out there you can read, so many videos you can watch. I think the most important thing is like having the drawing chops because that's something that is really, really hard to learn. But like composition, you can sort of, you can pick it up relatively easy, I think. Mm hmm. Hmm. So, to the draw, it's yeah, difficult. yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that was my next question, because all of your teachers are all figurative. And I mean, you do some figurative work. I've, you have some beautiful portraits on your website. But yeah, you've kind of really established yourself as a landscape painter. So that is interesting that you went in that direction. What is it that, you know, pulled you into that direction to landscape painting? Well, it I, I went in with the goal of being a landscape painter. Oh, you did? Uh, so because I took that landscape painting workshop with Stapleton Kearns, his snow camp workshop, he had a really popular blog about like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe some of the people that have been around for a bit more recognize the name. Uh, but I, even before that, when I was doing illustration, I was more into environment design. I love the Hudson River School. I was always more interested in landscape painting than uh, still life. I don't really have much of an interest at all. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly been the landscape that's drawn me. Like if anything, maybe I sort of chalk it up to being a little kid. I didn't grow up in a place where there was a lot of beautiful landscape. And when I was able to go to a place that did have that, it was usually uh, in the summers, my family would go to Poland to see my uncles and my grandparents and my cousins. And there it was really rural. It looks like something straight out of an Ivan Shishkin painting. And so, you know, maybe, maybe it's that childhood connection, like a little bit of nostalgia or, you know, wanting or just caring about the natural world and because you don't have it around you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but yeah. it's the thing I like for sure. But you did mention that you're interested in the Hudson River school painters and you don't live too far from the Hudson River and and New Jersey does look like New York. So why is it that New Jersey doesn't inspire you much? Well, I, I live in the suburbs right outside New York City. Oh, okay. And so for me to, and also, uh, I, you know, especially compared to the Hudson River school, uh, like the prime Hudson River School, when the Hudson River School painters were really painting things up and down the Hudson River was probably like the first generation Hudson River, like Thomas Cole, Asher Durand. By the time, uh, it, you know, Frederick Church, Albert Bierstadt, uh, their generation, they were sort of the second generation. By the time they were at the fore, they were doing a lot of uh, paintings of, you know, places out west or, uh, you know, Frederick Church has some great paintings from Central or South America or, you know, the Acropolis in Athens or all these sorts of places. So the second generation wasn't painting near and around all that much anyway. And the difference between when the first generation was painting around and now there's, there's no more farming in the area. Everything's yeah. basically over. There are uh, suburbs and highways and forests. And so if you go up the Hudson River, like uh, into Dutchess County, I've spent some time painting there with uh, the Hudson River Fellowship, GCA's sort of three-week landscape painting uh, residency type thing. 
uh that's really nice but it's about two hours away yeah where i live yeah so yeah and i think you know across across the northeast too uh i don't know exactly the history but a big change when farming became much more centralized you lost all these like smaller farms mm -hmm. farm didn't happen anymore you lost a lot of the scenes that people landscape painters used to paint yeah like if you go to Lyme, Connecticut, it used to be an artist colony and you had all these uh you just had cows wandering around and farms and fields for them and now it's mostly just built up and overgrown yeah so, i can't remember who it was who i was talking to about this but maybe it was james gurney how, talking about how there's just something really difficult and uninteresting about overgrown deciduous forests just like a just just like painting chia pets all stuck together <laughs> i mean they didn't say that but that's how i look at it so yeah i know what you mean i grew up on the hudson valley i grew up in newburgh new york which in my oh. house was literally i could literally walk to the river and um, it was quite beautiful if a body wasn't washing up onto shore. But other than, that, other than that, it was still quite beautiful because you have all these granite, you know, uh, cliff. I say I put cliff in quotes because now I live in Utah where there are huge rocky mountains. But, you know, granite cliff sides along the river that were still beautiful. But I know what, I know what you mean. It's It's pretty overgrown and overpopulated right now. So... But the other thing about the East, though, is they do have these great old neighborhoods. And I noticed that you paint a lot in Europe, these beautiful paintings of old buildings in Europe. And granted, I mean, the United States is so much old and younger than Europe. But um, have, have you ever been interested in painting some of the old neighborhoods in, uh, in the East? Yeah, I for the past some time I've wanted to paint in Manhattan a bit more. Yeah, you know Manhattan's got sort of the Beaux Arts uh, architecture, like turn of the century. I've done a few paintings. I've painted the Met before one time. I think I've painted uh, a few times in the city. Uh but it's really dangerous. <laughs> Not but it is kind of sketchy you know you never know if someone's just going to walk by and like punch you in the face and run away yeah that's the problem in new york city nowadays uh I mean, it's been like a few years but yeah uh and then uh, yeah you know those like colonial buildings don't really do it for me though oh really yeah well that makes sense so what was your path after you left florence academy in new jersey how did you get your career going from there it it took a while and it was actually a lot harder than i thought it would be took a while you're only 27 when did you graduate at what age did you graduate so so i technically graduated well it's fall of 23 i finished i i went into the program when i was 20. okay and so it was a three-year program and i technically finished it in, in june of 2019. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, uh, I was really, really lucky with this just super random email that was sent to the director, Jordan, about uh, residency in Giverny in France. And then I spent that summer painting basically in Giverny in like three for three months. I was like living across the street from Monet's Gardens. Wow. So that was pretty... And then I still I, at that point, I really had like no idea of uh, like a career path forward. I I just like didn't know. I think you're like, oh, I guess like try to get into some gallery. Like, how does this work? Like, what do you what do you do here? Um, and I ended up going back to Florence, to the school in Jersey City to FAA for uh, two or three more terms. I decided on two terms because I thought, well, you know, this is the only chance in my life where I could really push myself to get better at drawing. And if I leave the school now, I'm never really going to have that improvement. And there are still some things that I want to really work out in terms of portraiture or uh, in terms of in the model room. And then I figure I could also start doing some studio paintings instead of still lifes at the time of the school. So at that point, I sort of bought myself a little bit more time because I really didn't know what I was going to do. How does any of this work? So I decided like it would be safe. Like, let, let me just go to school like a little bit more 
and I was working on weekends and so at some like restaurant valet jobs and so it you know got through school that way and then the pandemic happened after that second term that I went back so March of 2020 the pandemic happened the world shuts down uh not like a great place to be in as like a young artist mm -hmm. that isn't what like how he's gonna go forward like how do you make anything happen uh and so what ends up what ends up happening in the rest of 2020 uh yeah i take a big a break from painting for a little bit because it's the pandemic it was just really depressing i thought i was never gonna see like half my friends ever again and like they're all going <laughs> different corners of the world to Australia, Canada, Europe, wherever, uh, like back to California or whatnot. Um, and so, but, um, uh, you know, after about a month or so, I started back painting on my own and I started reaching out to people I had met. I started applying to juried shows thinking that's like a thing that you need to do. Uh, and through, through a few different connections at the end of that year, in august september october i i was able to show with like three different galleries and so i thought oh okay this is like pretty cool like i have like people to send these paintings off to now like let me do that um and i guess i should say backtrack in at the very beginning of 2020 something that really important i applied for the donald journey fellowship mm -hmm. i won that but i wasn't able to use it that year because the pandemic happened. And so traveling to Europe wasn't really an option at that point. But so at the end of that year, I got uh, through people I knew from the school artists I had met, people that were ahead of me, reaching out to them, asking for advice, like asking to paint together. Uh, I got a few gallery connections. And so I sent out a bunch of paintings at the end of that year, at the end of 2020. And, you know, like they, uh, I ended up selling, you know, a, a few, quite a few paintings for that time. Cause I'd never really sold a painting at all. The first time I sold a painting was to a woman that walked up to me in June when I was plein air painting. And it's like, she asked me, I was doing this little nine by 12, how much it was. And I said, well, 300. And she said, yeah. And like, I was over the moon thinking like, oh my gosh, that would take me an entire weekend to earn doing my old valet job like that's awesome i just did that in a few hours and then later that year i got in with some galleries and they priced my paintings at even more and i was selling a few paintings and i thought oh if i do this like every quarter that could be like the start of the you know an income like maybe this is what happens and then in 2021 uh i didn't sell in the entire year as much as I sold in just the last three months of 2020. And wow. it was really like, well, this sucks. Yeah. Holy cow. I, I don't know what it was, if it's the market, you know, I've heard all sorts of things and guesses about what the market does and goes, but then you know, that, that sort of uh, made me feel a little disenfranchised about that route because my idea of looking at older artists was, okay, you get into a few galleries, you have a rotation, you send paintings to different galleries, and slowly through the year, things sell, and that's how you work as an artist. Yeah. Um and I thought, okay, well, I, I just got in with like these, you know, three galleries sort of kind of, um, but sales dropped precipitously in the new year. And the, the other thing that was happening at that same time, because it was COVID, it was stressful. My parents are, my parents immigrated to this country from Poland just a few years before. So they sort of have that, um, some people refer to it as like an immigrant mentality, mm -hmm. like go to school, get a degree, get a good job. Like this, that's what you need to do. Uh, and I sort of just bucked that. Uh, but they just for the record, that's not just an immigrant mentality. That's my parents mentality too. Yeah. Well, you know, that that's good. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. My parents push so hard. They're like, do not become an artist. It's like the dumbest thing you could possibly do. 
you know, and maybe they have a point. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, it's still early. You're going to do great. I'm, I, it, you're going to do great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, this year has gone well. Last year, Good. things started up. But back in 2020, 2021, things were still rough. Uh, and so I dropped out of college to go to FAA. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, in my head, I was like, this is what I need to do. Uh, I don't really like the program I'm in right now. I don't really feel challenged. I don't feel like I'm learning or growing at all whatsoever. Uh, but like these guys like over here, like FAA, these like classically trained artists, like that's amazing. I want to learn how to do that. Um, but at the same time, and also sort of to buy myself a bit of time, like what am I actually doing? Like my parents and all the pressure that I'm facing from them. I ended up going back to college just to finish a degree. I figured out if I go back for a general humanities degree, uh, I could still finish it in two years. I'd use all the credits that I earned already in the last two years for, uh, as free electives because a general humanities degree is very open and it's very broad and usually people minor uh, with something else in that but then i just went do that because my parents didn't really know what i was doing cause they just said like you, you just need that piece of paper mm -hmm. and so i just okay if i do this and right now all the schools uh all the classes are basically online because of covid and they're still going to be for the first year and they were for the first year and then even in the second year in the fall of 21 to the spring of 22 Things were sort of, uh, what's the word? A lot of it was more online still then. And so I felt like I was saving myself time while I didn't really have an idea of how am I going to make things work? How, like, how is it possible to build a career? I thought getting into the galleries would be it. But then I got into some galleries and I got those connections and I sold some paintings and then things just stopped selling. And I was like, well, this like sucks. I can't count on this. Uh, and I was in school and so I was painting all the while I was still trying to apply jury shows the, I had the grant from the Donald journey traveling fellowship. And so I ended up doing that in the summer of 21 and also, uh, the Hudson river fellowship happened for the first time in the summer of 21 for the first time in a few years, uh, the Hudson river fellowship, it's just a bunch of, uh, painters, young painters, mostly that are classically trained, uh, but not just from GCA, from a few different schools. And 21 was really special because we got to do it at this place called Weathersfield Estate in upstate New York, which is uh, the estate of a wealthy philanthropist who inherited his money from some banking fortune in the New York at mm. the end of the 19th century. And he built this sprawling like 800 or 1100 acre estate or something like that. It was like sort of a small mansion and there were 15 of us staying in it for three weeks. And that was just super fun. Wow. Uh, but so I was looking for things like that. So I was looking at grants. I was looking at possible residencies like the Hudson River Fellowship. I was looking at uh, different programs, whatever I could do to sort of just push my art forward, keep learning. Just to um, not to cut you off, but I'm a little confused on the the chronology now. Are you are are is this during the same period that you're back in college, or are we going back to before? Summer. Yeah, it was between it was between technically what was my junior and my senior year. Okay. Okay. And. Uh, gosh, what is it? 21. Yeah. Uh, and so I did that and then I went to Europe with the Donald journey traveling fellowship and I backpacked and I painted around Europe for like two and a half months by yourself. Basically. Really? I, I'd, I met, I met. Uh, I'd reach out to people in different cities that I knew from Instagram. I spent a lot of time in Florence because there are all these people I don't, I'd known only through Instagram that were at the real Florence Academy. So I reached out to them, uh, had, you know, had a friend in Spain. I, uh, met some people in some of the cities I was in, in Poland, in Austria. Uh, so, and then I just stayed at hostels. And so sometimes I'd hang out with whoever else was traveling. 
So you walked from hostel to hostel? N no, but. Oh, because you said you train. backpacked. So I'm trying to picture <laughs> like literally walking oh. from country to country. With a train pass. Oh, okay. But okay. I had two backpacks with me and that's right. how that trip worked out. And that was a really great experience. I learned a lot. I saw a lot of art and then I came back and I thought, okay, well maybe I could do something with these paintings. And those paintings basically like sat in my studio for almost a year. I tried maybe thinking maybe like one of the galleries could maybe do something and uh, nothing ever happened there, which I was a little frustrated with. Uh, and then I went back to school and that was also just frustrating going from just like having such a fun adventure to like being with a bunch of 20 year olds, like every Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That would be pretty anticlimactic. Yeah. Mm, and then, uh, you know, that year, that school year 2022 started, which is now about a year and a half ago, I did the portrait society which is actually the first time I met you, but you probably don't remember that. Are you serious, Georgia. dude? I apologize. No, I'm not making the connection. I didn't know who you were at the time, I guess. Yeah. So we've met That's... before? Briefly, briefly. Dude, I am a, such an a-hole. Sorry, man. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> um, um, uh, and so that was like one of those things that I was like doing like, oh, I should reach out to these other organizations in the US. I think the biggest downside to my education at FAA US was that I didn't really get out to these other organizations like the Portrait Society, OPA, these types of things. Because if I had done that, I probably would have met a lot more working artists. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that probably would have been a better experience, but that was something I was trying to do more of <clears throat> uh, on my own, just trying to like figure out like what, like what can I actually do? Um, and then college was sort of ending. Uh, I just got my degree like a few weeks ago because there was like a fee I didn't pay of like 90 bucks for a while. And so they never sent me and I never like walked or anything cause I didn't care about that place, but so I have the paper. <laughs> you got it, man. Good for uh, you. You know what? You know, I, uh, I dropped out of college in 2002 with three credits left. Really? Yeah. So good for you, man, well, for putting in two more years. I, all I had to do was take like, I think I had to take one writing class and one more painting class and I would have graduated <laughs> and I just didn't. It was, uh, ridiculous anyway. So good job. Um, oh, some of the classes I took were actually pretty okay, uh, because I was in a humanities, uh, track, the classes that we were taking were philosophy, history, those types of things. There was a poetry class that I thought was really interesting. And so I thought it was really interesting because it was all the sorts of things that weren't covered by an atelier. Right. So an atelier covers like the very technical sides of painting, but it doesn't really cover that much about art. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you see people that come out of those ateliers and their art, uh, it's the focus of their art is just to be really, really technical. Like what's the most clever way that they can paint something, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I've, I've sort of realized, uh, it sort of makes sense what some people do out of only coming out of that program. Right. And, and you know, everyone's work sort of looks like each other's and that's another thing for better or worse. Um, where am I going with this? Yeah. That's the thing about yours. I, I would never have guessed that you came out of Florence Academy. I certainly wouldn't have guessed you studied with Jordan Sokol and Amaya Gerpride. Like that's, that <laughs> blows yeah. my mind. Not, and just because. They're not landscape painters, you know, and, uh, you've taken this education and made it your own. Yeah. Uh, well that, that's a compliment certainly. Cause, uh, I remember there was a point in time where I felt my paintings were looking like re really bad, bad, bad knockoff. And I think, uh, you see that a lot 
in like Florence Academy, they all sort of paint like Mark D'Alessio almost. Mm -hmm. They're all filbert brushes. They're all using his like basic six palette color of a cadmium yellow, a yellow ochre, like a cadmium red, a quinacridone, an ultramarine, and a cerulean. And they're all using the same like paint mixtures. But these are mostly people that aren't landscape painters anyway. It's like whenever they try to pick up landscape painting, when I had seen it back then, it, it's like a school of thought. It is a school almost. And mm -hmm. they're also all working with sex the way Mark is doing. But I remember feeling like, oh no, like my paintings are just looking like a cheap knockoff of his. Yeah. And he was one of my biggest inspirations early on. And I made a conscious point, well, okay, like let me try to do things differently. Like I am going to put some earth colors on my palette. Uh, just like stuff like that. I'm going to try to apply paint differently. I'm going to use a palette knife. Uh, I'm going to uh, do this subtlety. Um, so expanding your influences, I think is also important. Mm -hmm. just, uh, it's not, I, I don't think it's a, I don't, I'm trying to think of like a nice way to say this. Um, you should be, I think generally when it comes to painting, uh, some people deride originality, but I think you should find and nurture your own voice or style or however you might call that. Um, and maybe even make a conscious effort to, if you see yourself looking a little too much like everyone else maybe you should ask yourself why that is and question what it is about your work that makes it look like everyone else's. Yeah. But maybe other people are doing things that you want to somewhat emulate that you think that your work uh, is a bit lacking. I think sometimes my paintings don't have enough contrast. And so I'm looking at my friends that actually pull off a bit more contrast in their paintings and okay, well, I'll try to grab that from their paintings. But I won't try to do everything exactly the way that other people are doing. Yeah. Uh, this episode is brought to you in part by Rosemary Brushes. If you're one of my listeners who's a professional artist, you're already using Rosemary Brushes. But for the rest of you, come on. Take your work a little more seriously. Stop buying the other brands. It's just not worth it. Every now and then you may get lucky and buy a good brush from another brand. But... Oh, Use the brand that professionals like myself are using. Go to rosemaryandco.com, link in the description or the show notes, and get yourself some quality brushes before your next painting. Yeah. One of the things I really liked about my teachers, and it's what I try to do now, because um, I, and I guess we can get into the more, because we're sort of derailed of like, how did I actually get to what I'm doing now? Yeah. Uh, I really, really admired the teaching style of Jordan and Amaya and Eddie. They would always uh, come to me and whatever I'd be working on, they would never just focus in and tell me, oh, this, this, and that is wrong. Like you need to fix those three things and go on their way. They always stopped and took time to explain larger principles of what we were actually seeing, how, what we need to do to actually see what we're doing wrong and change things and things like that. So they were always focused on those like core fundamentals, core principles, which it sounds like you're also a fan of, or that's more right. your way of doing things. And I think it's that type of an approach that is uh, a little bit less dogmatic and uh, hopefully leads everyone to help find their own style. Like the things that can make up your style is the types of brushes you use, the types of color you use, the types of surface you use, right. how you're actually applying paint. Um, and then, so, you know, your tools. And then also on top of that is the ideas that you have in your head. So the ideas you have about composition that, like if you're thinking about composition in a few ways, your paintings will reflect that. If you're thinking about how you observe color and how you key your painting in just a very specific way, your painting will reflect that. So the combo of like the tools and the ideas is very, um, I think that's the biggest aspect of style, more so than maybe your individual hand or your own tendencies. Uh, and I think the other thing, maybe, 
maybe this is one of the big advantages that I had because I went in going in wanting to do landscape and I had all of these teachers that were just talking to me about like bargs or casts or figures. And so I just was trying to figure out what's the connection. Mm -hmm. Whereas people, uh, you know, maybe they were going into class and they were just listening to like, okay, like tell me how do I make this figure painting better? And so they always had a narrow view of the lessons that they were taking in. They were never able to connect it. Maybe. Mm. I don't know. No, um, that makes sense. I mean, that's that's pretty insightful. I think that's probably possible. Okay, so where are you at now? I mean, you said 2023 was better. So you're feeling more comfortable with where you're going? I I think uh i really started hitting a stride in the middle of 2020 mm -hmm. um like instagram is a little bit of a stupid metric but it there there are definitely I, I i think it still definitely counts and just as an example uh at the at the beginning of june in 2020 i had about six and a half thousand followers mm -hmm. and that was right after i had decided uh not not that i decided that was right after i graduated college so no more excuse of like oh i'm still in college like i'll be a successful artist after i finish like that's what i'm right. telling my parents um i i had one workshop in lime so uh, a landscape painting workshop in lime through the school because jordan uh, offered me that uh, that was at the end of may and then that June, I was able to, I was back up at the Hudson River Fellowship for almost the entire month. And I was like, okay, well now I have like time, I'm gonna be painting every single day. And at that point I had decided to really focus on social media because up until that point, I was never really serious about posting regularly, about, uh, finding ways to share my work in an interesting way about making interesting content or any of that. Uh, I had decided to just start because I heard stories of like, oh, you know, yeah, like I started posting regularly and all of a sudden I grew like a few thousand followers. Um, so June, beginning of June, before the Hudson River Fellowship, I have like six and a half. And then by August, I have like 70 something. That's amazing. Just wait ballooned. in two months. Oh, yeah it was crazy holy crap what were you doing you just doing reels like crazy i mean i i neglect my social media like you wouldn't believe i mean it's terrible so what what was your secret back in that back at that point uh instagram was heavily pushing reels to combat TikTok, and uh i was doing reels and i just had a few of them that you know blew up several million views and that sort of encouraged okay i could do this i could sh sort of shift from this idea of being a more traditional fine artist to focusing more on what some people would call the creative economy mm -hmm. so and i i did a few things uh at the end of that summer now i had like all these followers it sort of encouraged me i took all the paintings from the Donald Journey Traveling Fellowship trip. I had like 50 some paintings. I was painting across Europe and like Italy and Spain and like the Netherlands. And I had like 50, like nine by 12 paintings. That... Yeah, I saw them all. I wanted one, but I didn't get it. I wanted oh, a bunch sorry. of them, but they were all sold. Yeah, you cleaned up. Well, so that was this most recent uh, sale. And so this was the first one. That was oh, okay. already done and each time they've done fairly well and it's always surprising that people get them but uh i thinking about them it, it to, to me it makes sense to do that mm -hmm. um the idea was well uh i now have all these followers i could price these nine by twelves at uh price them low sell them unframed uh just varnished but not have any of that else. And I just have a lot of paintings and I could sell them for a relatively affordable price. And all of a sudden, uh, rather than saving these nine by twelves, 
for a gallery. And from this point on, I think I really just want to continue keeping these nine by twelves for myself. Mm -hmm. One day I'd like to work with a gallery and show really big paintings through a gallery. Uh, if I could find a good one that actually moves work and we could have like a good relationship, but there it's, it's a bit, I don't know how, I don't know. Um, Long story short, that sale goes really, really well. Um, and then what did I even do? Oh, uh, and then I was applying to plein air festivals and I did that in October and I was going to travel, uh, in that, uh, September, I went to Europe for a bit, saw some friends, uh, went, visited Sweden, visited Norway, uh, did the master copies program about that November, I decided to start a YouTube channel. I started my YouTube channel. It's just Patrick Okra, same, same as my Instagram tag. Uh, I've started putting out videos there. I, and these are a bit longer format, some more tutorial-esque videos. And then this past year, uh, went, did a little painting trip to Florida, did a bunch of wave paintings, met some really nice people there that bought a few paintings of mine did a sort of spring cleaning studio sale, just a bunch of paintings I had lying around. I ended up organizing my own workshops in Europe, in Florence, in Venice, and in Krakow. Rather than waiting on people to like give me a workshop, I figured, oh, like for a plein air painting, I could just meet with a bunch of people in a city. I don't need to partner with someone or wait for someone to give me this workshop where they take 50%. I can now do that on my own because I have enough people that would actually want to sign up and it would actually be a feasible plan. And that's what I did this year. I did, I organized some workshops in Europe. Uh, I went there, I was there for about two and a half months. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Florence because I had a lot of friends there. I rented an Airbnb for a few weeks in Venice, the cheapest one I could find. And then I had friends visiting me while I was painting there and I was painting every day. And then I had the workshop there. And then I went down to the South of Italy for this little residency that uh, with a few friends, that was really, really fun. I made like a little adventure video of that specific thing. Like we got knighted by these old, old villagers and ah, it's just the entire trip is uh, Albanella is the little village. It was like wow. Mario and Chuck. Man, you've had some um, life for being 27 years old. You've lived, I mean, you've lived a and, uh, pretty exciting life so far. <laughs> um, maybe. Yeah, had, you have, man. Of, yeah, you got to appreciate it. <laughs> I, at times I still I haven't been to Europe. I'm 48 and I still haven't been to Europe. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah, I still haven't. <laughs> I got married at 22. Um, we, I mean, eventually I, I couldn't afford to go to your, it wasn't even a possibility. And then we had kids and then it became even more difficult and more, you know, yeah, it's just, you've had pretty, pretty exciting yeah. life. I mean, um, don't get me wrong. I love being married and having kids. Love it. So I've also yeah. had a great life, but it just sounds like you've had some um, very unique, uh, unique experiences that most people don't have in, in all of your travels and and uh the uh i don't know the exciting things that have happened to you in your career so far yeah you know between between the things that have come my way and the things i've been able to do i've been really lucky to be able to do that much that early on uh because i know that there's hopefully going to be a day where i won't be able to do that yeah you know i'm still 27 i'm single you know hopefully someday i have a wife and kids of my own i have a family but and at that point, you can't just like go travel Europe for two months. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, oh, Jeff, like, you know, when the kids grow up, you got to go, you know. <laughs> yeah, my youngest is 16. You know what we're doing? We're going to Rosemary Brushes to do my first workshop in uh, Britain. So that'll be my first time in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's nice. next uh, June. So, yeah, so that'll be my first time. I have been to Israel because uh, uh, I do the biblical paintings. And so I really, I just, I just bit the bullet and like, I, I can't be keep, I got to go to Israel. If I'm a freaking biblical painter and I haven't been to Israel, that's just wrong. So nice. I did do that, but that's my only travel outside the country. So, yeah, that sounds really exciting. 
Yeah, it'll happen. Yeah. It'll happen to me too someday. But so, okay, so let's talk about your art a little bit. Um, Gosh, I feel a little guilty because so I don't website, I don't update my website. Would you rather go to Instagram? Um, well, the thing with Instagram is I don't publish uh, like good photos. I always do the plein air paintings like in situ. And that's yeah. sort of the algorithm a bit more. Yeah, uh, I know. And like... then, it's so funny how Instagram works. You know, I, we need to talk more about the social media thing, but let's start with your wave. Okay. We mentioned that early on. You oh, know, I'm yeah. going to ask you a general question first before we talk about this um, specifically. But you said earlier that you, as you were learning figure painting and drawing, and I'm assuming you were learning, you said you used the Barg method. So you're doing sight size and stuff. How did you, you said you were looking for connections between what you were learning in school and what you wanted to do in the landscape. What connections did you make? And I'm so anxious to hear this because I've been a figurative painter for over 20 years. And uh, you seem to have a very consistent skill level between the figure and the landscape. I don't. I mean, I feel like while I don't think I'm an amazing painter in any genre, my portraits are leaps and bounds ahead of my landscapes. And so I'm anxious to hear what your connections are between the figure and the landscape. Mm -hmm. So I think a big thing for me was the type of education I got at FAUS and the fundamental aspect of that program was uh, painting from observation rather than painting conceptually. I think the opposite side of that spectrum, uh, if you look at academies like GCA or maybe ERA, the Academy of Realist Art, whether Toronto or Boston from some of the stuff I've seen them do, uh, those are the types of schools where you go, you learn that a ball is round and you learn that you have to paint form round like a cylinder or like a ball, mm -hmm. right? That type of thinking doesn't translate very well to the landscape, but the type of painting that we did at Florence Academy, uh, I, I call it mostly observational painting. We were painting our visual experience rather than uh, concepts that we had. And that's where the program started. And eventually, we get into some of those concepts, but very much later on, initially, we were really focused on, uh, you know, blocking in, finding the drawing, massing in the color, and looking for shapes of color and tiling things in, and achieving, you know, a gradient from the light into the shadow of a portrait, not by thinking about the way that the face turns or thinking that your shadows are greener and your uh, skin tones are more saturated orange or whatever, um, but just trying to see the color that's in front of you. And we're working in sight size, so we'd have our painting right next to the model. And that also helps you uh, paint that way where you're thinking of just observing what it actually is that you're seeing. So it was things like, uh, you know, painting big masses, half tones, looking for the color relationships, uh, looking for the lightest light, looking for the darkest dark. And then uh, if you go, uh, I think like one or two or three posts behind this, there's a pond with a light uh, that in the middle, right below it, that one. Right here. Right yeah. above it, that one. So if you go to the side, this was a demo I did in Prospect Park. And so it sh sort of shows you my process uh, just backwards. So, and this was actually done in site size as part of the demo for the workshop. I don't always work in site size, but sometimes I do. Sometimes it's really convenient. Yeah. But this is the basic idea. So Painting you're very literal. You you're very literal then in many cases. Uh. Yeah, I you know, I mostly just paint what I see because I think what I see is beautiful enough and the world is, you know, fine the way it is. Which is the Hudson River School mentality. Isn't um, it? It's not. It's not. No. See, the way I understand it, so I named my son after Cole and the way I understand it, he said something like, um, God is the greatest artist and his job is to just, you know, paint 
God, I'm totally slaughtering it, but to paint God's art, you know, have you heard a quote, something like that? I, I've heard of, I haven't heard of that quote by Cole, but so the reason I would say that the Hudson River isn't is because the Hudson River was largely a romantic movement. And so they believed in embellishing what they saw to achieve their highest ideal of beauty and truth. Uh, you know, they, they weren't painting the tree exactly as it, they saw it. They were painting the ideal type of that tree hmm. a bit more. And they were painting uh, more grander scenes. They were painting a lot of sunsets and sunrises and grand vistas. So they were a bit more of a romantic school of art rather than a realist school. Hmm. Uh, no, that makes I, sense I now that I think about the paintings. I'm going to have to check on that quote. Because uh, it's been so many years since I've actually read it. Maybe I've got the wrong artist and the wrong quote. I'll have to look into that again. But yeah. so you really well, so, are you really are feeling like, look, the landscape is beautiful enough. I don't need to edit much, if at all. Yeah, and you know, the, I I edit a lot, mostly in just choosing my subject matter. It's not like I'm painting my backyard here in New Jersey. Okay, but I'll go out and like choose something that. I, I like that I think is like pretty or whatever, and then I'll paint that. Um, hmm. And yeah, and also technically, if you look at what uh, the artists of the Hudson River Fellowship were doing, so Cole, Bierstadt, uh, Church, they were in a way pre-impressionistic. So they were... Um, they were doing a lot more studies outdoors and go then later going back into the studio and compiling those studies and arranging them into compositions of places that didn't necessarily exist. Hmm. So that was also a bit of them working towards their ideal of beauty and nature, but they were still very much concerned with beauty and nature for sure. Um, but in some ways, I think in some ways I'm a bit more, I would say impressionistic in uh, Ram Stevenson's sense of the word, or maybe mm -hmm. so not necessarily like, cause when people think of impressionistic nowadays, they think of, uh, I think it's just loose painting. It's like the, yeah, exactly. which is like non-impressionism. Yeah. Um, what I mean by that, uh, you probably read Ram Stevenson's book on Velasquez. He says that Velasquez was the first impressionist because he was the first person to actually paint what he saw. No, and I didn't that, read that book and I haven't heard that. That's interesting. So it's the case that Velasquez was the first impressionist. And also in the 19th century, uh, a lot like Carolus Duran, there were a lot of people in uh, the Parisian schools and the ateliers back then and the Col de Beaux Arts and like the Carolus Atelier. Uh, some people uh, would joke around as there being a cult of Velasquez, even. So Velasquez was very much uh, very appreciated back then at that specific point in time. You've had on Micah, Christ Micah Christensen, right? Oh, many times. Yeah. It was from him that I heard, I think he was doing a presentation at Lime and I tuned in for their live stream. Uh, so he went back and he found in the archives of the Prado that like within the same gallery in the Prado, all uh, Manet, Sargent, Soroya, all three of them were copying Velasquez in the very same gallery yeah. in the very same day. Yeah, like, that's crazy. I, um, but so this idea that was uh, really popularized back then. Uh, so the ideal was, you know, beauty, but also truth, uh, staying true to the visual impression, painting what we actually see. And uh, in my art, I, I feel like I went through a period where I didn't really know what, uh, like what I wanted my paintings to look like. I had a lot of like, I guess kind of insecurities like, oh no, I want my paintings to look like this. I want it to look like this. Like I want them to be more textural. I want them to be this and this and that. Um, a big uh, impact on me was obviously seeing Sir uh, Velasquez's paintings at the Prado. I think that's like, if you need, if you want to go to Europe to see like one thing, go to the Prado. It's the best thing. Really? Um, that's what I think. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt.
Yeah. But I, you know, I saw that. And the other thing I was able to see, I went for a week with some friends to Paris in the very beginning of 22. They had a temporary exhibit, a retrospective on Ilya Repin. They had like 150 of his paintings. And so that made a real impact on me because it was just gallery after gallery after gallery of his paintings. And they were painted so simply. Like they were just very direct. They were just very honest. It was just the right color in the right spot. He wasn't fussing over making all these like different clever little marks of texture. He was just painting what it was, it, what, what, what was in front of him. Hmm. And so for me personally, I think uh, when I've when I sort of came to the point or accepted, well, okay, you know, maybe maybe the point of my paintings, like maybe for them to just be beautiful and to be truthful of what I'm actually seeing is good enough, and I don't need to like have my head spinning around all these different clever ways to make my paintings look really really cool, because that's all I'm trying to go for with my paintings to make really cool paintings. Hmm. Um. Maybe that's my problem. I've been hearing, so, you know, obviously with the podcast, I hear a lot of different perspectives on painting. And as a portrait painter, that's my goal. I mean, I'm working on a family portrait right now. It happens to be the first time I'm painting my own family, which is crazy, you know, the plumber's sink. But my son just left home about seven months ago. So it was like, man, it's about time I get started on my own family portrait because it's all it's all coming to uh well i was going to say an end but a new stage in life um but my goal is to nail that likeness to paint what i see exactly the way i see it to a point right that but that's that's a huge part of my goal is to capture that person the way i see it but many landscape painters don't think of it that way they're you know it's more about design uh more about making a pretty picture, you know, than it is about capturing the scene. And so, you know, there's obviously there are specific ideas and very specific approaches that fall into that large generalization. But I, yeah, it's been confusing because it's like, <laughs> is it okay to just paint a landscape like you would paint a portrait to just make a portrait of the landscape, so to speak, is kind of uh, the big question I've had. And it sounds like you're saying it is. Uh, to, to an extent. Okay, so I do give the me the exception. What's the exception? So, and so this is the way I structure a lot of the workshops when people come and we study. Uh, if I'm doing like an extended workshop for four or five days, I'll spend the entire first day just talking about composition. And okay. Like comp skip drawing yeah because so you know the actual execution of this painting i'm very much sticking to what's there but uh in this painting in particular there was a lot of thought that went into what uh how i was arranging the scene how i was fitting the scene the rhythms that i had the alternating angles in in the very last one i posted earlier this morning it was a seascape and i figured out uh this weekend so those are pinned but it was the technically the fourth one yeah you see all the comp studies i did below it uh i figured out you could use a whiteboard while you're doing so i could have, like scribble things on the side so that was really that's really useful. smart yeah uh and you see sort of like also the diagrams it's the different types of waves that form there are three types of waves basically uh it's not always that the wave perfectly barrels and then also there's a perspective to the waves as they barrel. You never want to look straight on. I, I generally tend to want to look a little bit off to the side when I'm painting a waves. But at the bottom, I have like five different compositions. And it was only on the fifth one that I really found something that I was comfortable making a painting of. And I really stress when I'm teaching workshops, I really stress that uh, the worst thing, one of the worst things that can happen is you spend like two or three hours really struggling to make a really nice painting, painting exactly what you see, uh, whether it's a specific tree or a building. And by the end of those three hours, you make a really, really nice painting. And then you realize that the composition is just awkward and that painting should have never been made in the first place. Yeah, that is really frustrating. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that so many so, times. 
un underlying landscape painting, I think is composition is one of the biggest thing because unlike making a portrait painting where it's just, okay, just, you know, put the head a little bit above center. If they're looking off to the side, make sure that there's more room in front of them than behind their head. Uh, landscape painting is a bit more focused on actually like composition, like how, like what's the arrangement of this painting that you're making? What are your masses? What are the rhythms? Uh, like, are you incorporating mid-ground, foreground, background, that sort of stuff? So, hmm. but after getting that composition, then it's a very straightforward process of, I think, the easiest thing that you can do, and also the, uh, is to just paint what's in front of you. When you start trying to make stuff up, that's, like, the fastest way to just get confused and lost. But if you just paint what's in front of the landscape in front of you, in a composition that's already a decent composition, that's a really straightforward way of making just a really nice painting. Okay, so um, I'm sure there's not a contradiction here, but you know, it kind of sounds like one. Let me pull up something I saw recently. Maybe, uh, I hope I can find it quickly here. But you did a compositional critique of one of your students. Oh, that, that's way up, way up there. Way up. So this was... Yeah, okay. I, one of the things I recently started was a Patreon and on the Patreon, I have a mentorship tier so people can meet with me for either half an hour or a full hour. And then we talk about their paintings. I think yeah, their paintings. Up. Okay, so you're moving things around. So you're not painting what you see. Because you're moving things around. So can you be more clear on what you mean by what you see? Are you talking about getting the values and colors right, but but the shapes can be different? Well, so this composition was after the fact. Uh, what she could have done in her painting was move herself closer to the trees to achieve a composition oh. where the big thing was, I think in this painting, the, the background was just really too big and it was the exact same size as the foreground. Right. So one of the things I'm constantly uh, thinking and pushing of is to have variety, to have variety in your masses and your elements, like that mountain and that tree, they're the exact same height. So in real life, what you can do is you could just walk a lot closer to where the trees are bigger and then those mountains are back. And so you can crop them to a way that the masses are all have a variety that no two masses are equal shape and size. Hmm. But this is a critique on composition. And then also uh, the way that we create depth sometime with masses, that little squiggle up there is because the largest mass is the tallest and in the middle. And then it goes to the right with the second largest mass and then off to the left on the third largest mass. That's a little tip. I, do you know Ivan Shishkin's painting, Rye? I don't know. Uh, can you screen share it? The why I think that is such a classic landscape painting, how that references to the uh, compositional critique that we were just looking at. If you notice those trees, and you look at the height of every single tree, mm -hmm. those trees zigzag through the painting. So the, it's the tallest one to the next tallest one going down to the one to yeah. going back around doesn't have any leaves at all that dead one. And then it's not a perfect zigzag because that would be static. It's a much more organic zigzag, but it reflects the rhythm of the, of that winding road that winds in through the composition. Like our eyes led in to the depth of that composition through that road and he does that with the size and the placement of his elements in the painting too, with those trees. Yeah. So let's say that you saw a scene that looked a lot like this, but these trees were all the same size and, and all the, on the same plane. So you can't just walk closer or farther to change their relative size. Would you, uh, would you make one bigger and one smaller in order to create this composition or does that go against your approach as a landscape painter? You know, so this is a, a studio painting that we're looking at. Yeah. I would like to get to the stage. Like that's kind of the goal I have for myself that one day I'm painting paintings to this level and to this quality and to this size. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's not a plein air study and for a plein air study i much i'm much more comfortable focusing on what it is and i i glossed over this the easiest thing to do is to paint exactly what's there because all of a sudden that ju that just means everything is drawing like if your painting's not working well how is it different from what it is that you're actually seeing so you you're know, simplifying some... your problems outside yeah like you, you just you just paint the thing you don't need to worry about the composition if i make a if i make a a studio painting from that study later on that's something i could probably do but outside i i don't really ever do that that much hmm sometimes but not much okay but here's a here's yeah. another example of so, something that would kick my tail cuz it's just a green what, painting what the heck that, how do you manage all these shapes oh you have it right there no kidding yeah uh i'm i need to make a second layer on that painting this was a demo for one of my patreon uh videos and it's still just getting started but the point of this was like how do you make a green painting oh uh, i asked the right question that's exactly the point <laughs> like it's just it's just green how do you find it um there are a, a few of the key lessons of this painting uh so because green is like one of the most challenging colors for people to see mm -hmm. and I, I give this little story to people uh you know in this video or in workshops so uh if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum and if you look at chromaticity charts if you look at how what part of that spectrum is visible green it's the largest part really no yeah. kidding uh, chromaticity charts they're basically a visual representation of the amount of hues that our eyes can distinguish between and so green is by far the largest space on those charts our human eye can distinguish between so much color that we just call green now if you uh there are a few articles that i read re uh not too long ago that sort of helped me create this idea of why that is and why is green so hard to say uh so in homer's odyssey or iliad in his in his great epic poems they don't actually have the color blue mentioned at all like they have like white they have black they have yellow they have red uh but when they're referring to the aegean sea he ref he describes it as a deep wine color for instance hmm. the color blue isn't used in those poems at all uh and other type of i don't know if it's like a linguistic forensic or arch uh anthro anthropologists have studied the origins of human language and they basically think that blue is one of the last colors to have been invented that you would have gotten a word for and uh maybe there are even some uh indigenous languages in say like the, the australia in australia where if i'm remembering this right where they don't have so many names for blue they just have like a, a name for oh it's a light color or it's a dark color but not really a word that translates really well to blue, but they have like tons of words that relate to different oranges and reds and to the colors that they're actually surrounded by. It's so strange um, because the entire sky is blue. You would think that'd be one of the first colors that human beings yeah, would connect any, with. Yeah, but they don't have any blue pigments. Oh, oh like that's historically, valid. Purple, those were some of the last pigments to become really popular uh and so other languages uh other languages i think it's like russian or japanese they have multiple words for either blue or green and i i'm not i don't fully remember which exact language and which exact uh color but when scientists have done these very simple studies of people that have grown up speaking different languages where they have multiple names for different colors they actually do a much better job of differentiating between hues mm -hmm. like if something's slightly off they'll do a better job of identifying 
which of these eight color swatch swatches is actually off. But the people that don't have that vocabulary to differentiate uh, the different way that we think of uh, different colors, uh, they just see all green or all blue or whatever color they're studying. Yeah. Now, the way that this ties up to greens is if you think that this landscape is just green, that's what you're going to see. Uh, if the way that you paint, the way that you understand like color or chroma or value, if you look at the world and you think that the world is really, really colorful, you're going to make really colorful paintings. If you look at the world and say that the world is really muted and gray and it's accented by color, you're going to make very tonal paintings. I think the way that we think and see, the way that we think really influences the way that we see. When it comes to actually painting greens, I think what uh, is the most helpful thing to do then is change how we think about greens. So rather than having that huge spectrum, like there's so much green out there, rather than just thinking of all that green, what you could actually try doing is uh, being very painterly about it. So asking yourself, is that a viridian? Is that a chromium oxide? Is that a sap green? Is that a terra vert? Uh, if you've done, like, say, if you've done like those Richard Schmidt color charts, you know, is this a cadmium orange and ultramarine blue, or is this cadmium yellow and an ivory black? Because you you know what color mixtures are possible with what color charts. That's another way to almost expand your vocabulary to think of different greens rather than just green everywhere. Right. Okay. Not. I don't want to. I don't want to get off of this. Um, thought, but I just want you to clarify, do you have a large palette of greens? Cause you just named four different greens. Do you actually have no. four different greens on your, okay. Okay. So, but when, uh, so when you, when you name those four greens, you're just making the point to think bigger, think more expansively about the different types of greens. Yes. What I, what I do myself, um, on my palette, I have Viridian but I tell people that I don't use Viridian to mix greens. I use Viridian to mix chromatic darks or buildings or things, but I rarely use Viridian to mix greens. Uh, but Ivory Black I use to mix greens. And I think Ivory Black is a really convenient color to mix greens. Uh, and other than that, I have uh, two cadmium yellows, like a cadmium yellow lemon or light or cadmium yellow medium or deep, depending but just to have a variety, just to have two rather than just one. And then I also have yellow ochre because yellow ochre is also really convenient. I have cobalt blue and ultramarine blue. And so between those, I have a pretty deep range of colors. And uh, what I, the biggest thing I tend to do is I think of, uh, I can look into the greens and I know, okay, these aren't all the same greens. Is this a yellowish green? Is this a bluish green? Is it a saturated green? Is it a more orangish green? Is this color actually just a desaturated yellow? Uh, you know, things like that. But it, hmm. it's a combination of all of it. You know what this reminds me of? A conversation I had recently with a friend of mine's husband. And uh, this friend is actually a student who's learning to paint. And uh, he said, it's been so strange living with a painter and learning about how she sees the world. He says, because for my entire life, this guy's 60 years old for my entire life, I've looked at the sky and just saw blue. And now that I'm married to a painter, I can see that it's blue, but then it gets lighter and yellower as it gets close to the horizon. I've never noticed that in my 60 years on the planet. And I found that so strange. So I started asking around. No one notices it. And then I started asking, did you, did you, can you see, I would point to some, to a mountain, you know, of course we have a lot of those here. Can you see that purple, that that mountain is purple? Oh, oh yeah, I guess it is to a 40 or 50 year old. They've never seen it. And it, it I don't know, <laughs> this might not be exactly what you're saying, but it kind of, to me, it goes to that point of looking bigger, looking, uh, expanding your your seeing range and really looking hard at what's actually there. Um, another example is, you know, I'm teaching, teaching um, one of my students 
color and we were looking out at a distant mountain and our subconscious, we know that there's a green trees on the mountain. In Utah, they're like scrub oak. So it's like a bl very blue green. Mm -hmm. But the mountain is so far away that the green is completely, there is no green left. It's a, a blue gray with maybe a tinge of yellow. I mean, it's so slight. But because consciously they know it's green, this student was painting her mountains really chromatic green. And, and, they, and she couldn't see that it was literally no longer green. But she saw a tree, she interpreted trees are green, so she painted it green. And I remember pointing it out to her and, being, and her going, but it's green, look at it. I'm like, no, look at it, look at it next to a real green, look at it next to a tree close to you, make that comparison. She's like, oh yeah, it's not. But it's strange, we walk around this planet and if you're not painters or if you have no other reason to look carefully, all these things are invisible. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I remember the first time I, the, the sky thing was pointed out to me. I think I remember. The you remember moment. that? See, I don't remember not seeing it, but I know I was that way. I know everybody is. It must have been. I just don't remember. I remember, that, I remember that Eureka moment, though, uh, because especially what you need to do is you need to go outside, look up at the zenith of the sky, the highest point that's like opposite the sun that's usually the part that's the darkest and the bluest and then you can observe the gradient uh going down from that point to being above the horizon line and it's just night and day when you see that there's almost there's so little blue on that actual horizon line it's so just, it's just not blue most yeah of the time. i know yeah it's crazy it is yeah so okay so back to the green thing so after this explanation, um, how did you apply that here? And yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit more in terms of application in this particular demonstration. Uh, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. I think, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the painting process of this is really simple to that other one where I demoed it, where I first indicate the drawing of the painting. So before this, I did a compositional sketch because I made sure that the arrangement on the painting, the masses, everything was a different shape and size. Uh, the lawn compared to the trees, compared to the little bushes, compared to the sky, no two shapes are too similar. So I picked a pretty, a composition that I was just, uh, you know, not upset with that I think uh, worked and was successful. And then... I, I drew in a few of the big lines with the with my brush. I mixed up a generic green, and then I painted the, after getting the big proportions, one of the big things I'm always focused on when I'm painting is working big to small. After getting the big proportions in, I started from the sky and I worked my way back, massing in, blocking in the biggest shapes of colors. And particularly the sky, because that's kind of a conventional landscape thing. You paint whatever's furthest back first, and then every time you paint something over something, it's uh, coming closer in the distance, and so the paint physically mirrors what's actually happening back mm -hmm. there. Like, oh, that tree's overlapping the sky, so the paint's going to physically do that too. That helps create a bit of the depth. It also sort of just, it's a bit like, it's a simple march forward through the painting. So mm -hmm. It's kind of... And then, you know, I... <laughs> Was doing that by looking for the big averages of the big masses of color, saying, okay, this part's darker, this part's lighter, this part's that. And then I go back in and I keep refining into smaller and smaller shapes. And it's pretty, pretty straightforward, I'd say. So one thing I've noticed when painting outside with green grass and certain types of vegetation is it's just almost neon green. And I find that a lot of artists tend to cool or warm it up a little bit, put a little bit of orange or more yellow into their greens just to knock it back so that it's more earthy and not so bright. Do you do that as well? Or is that just a photo that makes it look like that? Um, so, you know, I, I think the way you think about it is the more important uh, thing that's at play. So, uh, if if you just arbitrarily 
add orange or red to your greens, that might be like your painting might be successful because you're going to be neutralizing it and it's going to be a bit more harmonious and it's not going to have that like putrid acidic color to it, which I don't think is quite nice either. Or rather than just sort of having like an arbitrary decision, you can choose to see it that way because you can say that, okay, you know, how do I want to paint this green? I need to remember that that green, if I mixed up my yellow and my viridian, and if I made like the greenest color on my palette possible, that green is nowhere near as green as that. So I'm not going to try to paint it so colorful because I know that it's actually not that chromatic, that pure. Sometimes like if the, if the sun is in front of you and the lawn is being hit from the back, then that type of yellow will be very, very yellow because the, the grass is like uh, translucent and it's being right. illuminated. Those are the situations where it's like really colorful, but in overcast lighting in front lit, uh, generally I like to work when things are front lit because that actually tones down the chroma a bit. And so if you're choosing a green subject matter, it's a bit easier if it's overcast or front lit. And then it's a matter of looking for trying to see the variety within the green. Yeah. So those are all decisions that are happening in your head on how you're choosing to see the world rather than using a convention. Oh, make sure to tone down your greens, make sure to add red, which is true, but it's not, it's not the core right in a way like right. it's sort of like a surface level principle that you can rely on to get you good paintings but if you don't really understand why you're doing that it might be like that's when you know no you're speaking my language so what you're saying is by just adding orange because it works that's a device but understanding why it works and then choosing accordingly is a principle the principle is the why and then but but just to add it just because your teacher told you to add it because greens as you put it are putrid <laughs> these types of greens um would be more of a device or a a trick of sorts yeah yeah, yeah. and so this relates to when i when i was um like when i was in florence academy uh like, you know, Jordan, literally one of my favorite artists ever, love his work. One of his critiques was, uh, we live in a gray world accented by color. Things aren't actually that colorful. Hmm. And that's one of the things that he came around to say. But if you look at Sargent's paintings, Sargent's paintings are very colorful. So what's actually happening? I think you have two examples of like great artists that are seeing the world in a different way because they're thinking of it in a different way. What you have Sargent doing is his paintings were, you know, also just probably the subject matter because the walls were really, really gray in the studios at Florence Academy. But uh, Sargent's paintings would always be right next to the sitter. And so what he was working, what he was doing when he was working is he was working from the mid-tones out largely like he was looking for the great half tone if you ever read that that pdf mm -hmm. of the carol book or like some of the accounts of his students and so then he was modeling the shapes and he would save the accents and the highlights for last so what he doing is he was translating the value range in order to maximize the range within the mid-tones and so the lights and the darks were at you know they're at the extent of the range, but you know, he had a lot of volume to face because he was seeing when you step far back enough from a painting, you'll notice how it's just a flat painting. You'll notice your dark parts to the painting are actually like really light compared to the darks within your subject matter. Mm -hmm. And so when you have your up against your subject, uh, just one to one, when you step far back enough, you'll notice how you'll notice the limit of your painting in capturing the value and the color of what it is that you're painting. Yeah. And so Sarge, in both in color and in both in value, he would expand that range to try to capture what he was seeing. 
and he was still very much painting what he saw. He wasn't making these colorful decisions just to make it more colorful. Uh, if you look at any of his paintings, they're just actually just really, I almost call them reserved, but they're, they're just truthful. They're just, he's just painting what he saw, but he saw things in a very refined way. Mm -hmm. Like the step back, my best guess of why he insists on stepping back, having experienced this on a few paintings myself, when you step far back enough, that's when you'll notice like, oh, I can push the range in my painting to make it look more three-dimensional because otherwise, sometimes when you have a painting and you're not working with your painting right next to your uh, subject, when you don't have a painting right next to your subject, um, like you're like, okay, lightest light in my subject, darkest dark in my subject, lightest light in my painting, darkest dark in my painting. And you're sort of doing these loops through your mind on translating what it is that you're seeing into your painting. And you can make really, really great paintings like that, but you won't expand your range. Hmm. To, Get as close as you can because sometimes you know sometimes you can go up to a painting and like there are certain times in a painting that you'll see it it, it feels like a window into another space yeah i that was my experience with uh with velasquez at the prado with a few monet paintings in the monet marmoton in paris uh because there were smaller landscapes of his that just looked like a window into reality of a different place and time and also with the floral painter, uh, Fontaine Latour. Mm -hmm. I would say all of those painters were heavily impressionistic because they were very focused on painting what they saw. And they, they just had that perfect pitch, that perfect key of like light and value that made it feel like a real space. So when you say expanding your value range, do you mean literally when you step back because a black brushstroke or a, a let's say a dark gray brushstroke is actually a brushstroke illuminated by light versus on your subject it's the absence of light to some degree that when you step back you recognize that you can't possibly you're, you're not getting it dark enough so you push it further than you see it from up close in order to create more depth um, well, on, on like a still life in a very, like, uh, in a very, um, like in a, in a very still life environment where you've got your shadow box and everything, you'll be able to have something that's pitch black, uh, in most, most of the situations in the world, especially outside, especially when you have a natural, a lot of natural light, you, you don't have those types of situations no. where you ever get a that's really black and I'm speaking mostly in terms of the midtones. Okay. Cause like you can't every black darker, but you can expand your range in your midtones. You can make your dark midtones darker and you can make your lighter midtones lighter and clearer. And when you look at like a lot of Sargent paintings, he has a lot of contrast in his paintings. And there are a few paintings that I sometimes, uh, use as an example, uh, he, he he has he can have a lot of chromatic range too because the same things if you're choosing to see the world that way uh you can you can also expand your color because you'll notice that like your color is not as colorful as the real world so like your reds are not going to be as colorful so you can push the chroma of your warms and your cools and sergeant did that and mm -hmm. there are other painters that instead of choosing to see the world as being super colorful and our paintings are just uh, like just this little flat plane filled with dirt and oil that, you know, we're trying to get it to the, be the real world, but we're not doing that good of a job. Um, there are other painters that choose to see the world as uh, they, they imagine the pure color out there and they notice how uncolorful the pure color or how, how saturated and how muted the color is to a pure version of that color. Like if there was a pure green out there in this scene, then all of that green would look so much less colorful. Mm, I see what you're that saying. Mm -hmm. Well, you're talking about so, simultaneous contrast. I mean, it's just the relationships in color. Yeah. Yeah. But so basically like you can choose the way you think of a scene and that's how 
that affects how you key the painting, not just in terms of value, but also in chroma. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that's an interesting explanation. I've never heard it put that way, but I like it because, it, as you put it, it is principle based. It's it's more about thinking than just mindless copying. Yeah, and it, and it's also it's less it's not. Uh, I'd like to think it's not that formulaic. Doesn't sound like it is at all. Yeah. No, but it sounds people... kind of refreshingly simple. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe maybe when you describe it, it sounds v very intellectual. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it does. I mean, it's not something that the lay person is going to not, I mean, the lay person is going to hear you talking and be like, what? Right? But but in application, it sounds refreshingly, refreshingly simple. So you're saying, yeah. choose how you want to think about the world and paint it accord accordingly. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, from painting to painting, you can choose to see things differently, depending on the subject matter. Once hmm. you have that, like, understand that. Yeah. So there can be scenes where you decide to tone the color down. Like I sort of did with this painting. I, I, I went for the moments where it wasn't pure green because I wanted to see the variety in the color within the green. So rather than exposing for the green or i was exposing for the green i wasn't exposing for something more neutral like if um yeah yeah i like that you're you, thinking like a, a camera in a way exactly I, I make a lot of parallels to a camera so sometimes have you tried taking like a photo of a painting and there's a specific color cast to the painting and what your camera does it like auto corrects mm -hmm. So it, rather than getting like the muted, beautiful, like grayish tones of the painting, like it just ups the contrast in a whole lot of different ways and it's annoying. Yes, especially with your cell phone. I was trying to send a picture of a painting I'm working on to my son and it kept trying to make what I had done look more like flesh. It was driving yeah. me crazy, especially with all the computerized, I mean, the com cameras with all this, you know, computerization in them now instead of a simple aperture and light sensitive surface i mean it's they do that all the time now yeah there it's the algorithms that are have been like trained to try to make the most like pleasing photos and what they find is that people tend to prefer things that are colorful and contrasted so mm -hmm you don't have you don't have the same manual settings as you would on a, a real camera on a dslr or a mirrorless camera nowadays but much less a film camera right uh so you know when i was painting these greens i was exposing for those greens in a sense because i was looking into the variety within the greens rather than trying to just capture all the green like just one that makes sense so for That's example just just to make it more suitable for a lay person <laughs> like myself so you're uh let's say you took these mountains back or not mountains these these hedges back here and you initially said you were just looking at those and you said to yourself these are very vibrant yellow green and then you started with that color, by the time you get to the grass, you're burning out your retina with fluorescent green. So what you have to do is expose to a different green that's more muted so that you don't end up with this crazy bright painting. Yeah. And so uh, I like I did mix a little bit of red into those greens, probably a lot of those greens. And even better, like just little like, uh, if, if you want just like a simple trick without like the really complicated explanation, just use black to mix your greens. Well, like I've kind of black. figured that with these trees up here that you did black and uh, yellow or yellow ochre or something. Is that right? Uh, a lot of black with cadmium, but I, I would still modulate it throughout. Like mm -hmm. I added the blue in some areas and hints of red. What and about in your painting... shadows though? How do you, I mean, uh, but do you mix shadows with black too or does that make them 
too void of chroma and make them uninteresting and dull? Uh, yes. I try to mix the shadows more with maybe more ultramarine blue and maybe a bit of yellow ochre, a bit of cadmium yellow okay. or blue and burnt sienna is a really useful color because the thing to remember outside is nothing approaches real black. And so you shouldn't use black for your shadows. You could for artistic choices, but oftentimes it doesn't work out that well. Now, do you mean black as a color or black as a value? When nothing, you say nothing approaches real black, are you talking about uh, a number 10 on the grayscale? Are you talking about black as a hue? Um, I guess more than number 10 on a grayscale. And I sort of just use that interchangeably with ivory black. Because mm. unless someone uses like Vanta black as an oil paint, we don't really have anything that's darker, right? Right. Right. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, maybe let's look at some of your other work here. This is one of the ones I wanted, by the way, that got sold. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I freaking love this. So you talked about one of the things that you learned at Florence Academy were drawing skills. And, uh, that's one thing that I really admire about your, your, uh, plein air paintings. This, I feel like I'm a pretty good draftsman. And yet this would intimidate me to do in plain air. I mean, that's, there's a lot there. Well, oops. You know, what's that? It was two days. It wasn't just one. So tell me about that. Do you work out the drawing in day one and not worry about the light and the color and then come back in? And now that you've got a solid drawing, you can relax and focus on light and color uh, kinda i think uh is this like two things in this post oh maybe this is just like pictures of krakow yeah never mind okay um somewhere else i have an example of that painting between the first and the second day uh that painting was done on, oh a little bit down i think maybe oh there's another one that oh god I, there was another one i wanted to point out all of these look at the what the crap man your drawing skills are really good well, and this one really this ass. one jeez louise man okay all right now we got to get back back to the other one but here's one of the things i noticed about this you say you're copying but you're not completely copying because you're making lib you're taking some serious edge liberties here and not to mention Tom. not to mention um I mean, maybe it's just a photo, but I've been outside and looked at buildings. You're also taking some value liberties here, reducing the value range inside this area. Are you not? So, so this was actually an important piece for me to make. Okay. Uh, a lot of things clicked. Yeah, this I'd was say a painting. So. This was a painting where I chose to see uh, the variety in the color temperatures. And I chose to key for those. So I, I would say that I did see it that way. I noticed it was marble and I noticed that, uh, cause, you know, you could do little tricks if, uh, in the shadows to notice how to notice how, so like keying a painting is deciding like where your darks and where your lights are and like where the things fall in between and how colorful does it get and or how gray does it get, right? So you key in terms of value, but you also key in terms of color. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things you do when you're outside is uh, you can make a little tiny hole with your hand and look through that little hole and you will notice how much lighter everything is compared to the deep shadow within your hand. And what? So Where'd you learn way... that trick? Uh, that's really smart. All these years, I've never even heard that. That one, I, that one I figured out from a good friend of mine, Andre Katarina, because I was like just isolating the color a lot, but I saw him like do that, like just a really, really tiny hole once. And I was sort of asking him, and I think it was from him, but Basically, you see the shadows within and you can see how, just oh. how light. Every... 
So like, you're you're you, overcoming you're, your own natural eyes and brain's tendency to balance the values and seeing them as they are. Because yes, because our, our brain lies. Us, yeah, our brain lies. It it pulls out contrast where it's not, so we can see form. And you know, at we can see form to our uh, to a maximum potential, so that we don't, you know, fall off cliffs, and we can recognize objects in low light situations, and so on and so forth. I would assume. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that, that's an amazing it, trick. I like that. I was keeping the darkest darks keyed up. But also because I had this like big thing just right in front of me, this big lantern, because I was off to the side next to the Trevi Fountain. Oh, and yeah. so I could shadows actually were nowhere near being dark. And then I chose to emphasize uh, the color shifts that I was seeing. So there was uh, obviously there was the cast light of the sun, which was really uh, warm and orange. And so on the light areas, you have it hitting the white marble and then the white marble in shadow is darker uh, uh there are different color casts because of the stone some of the marble is very white and has a lot of blue cast from the blue sky because it was a pretty clear sky uh some of the deep shadows are a bit redder other parts of the shadows are a bit more orange because of some reflected light um marble in particular there's a lot of uh color reflection or marbles transparent so when you look at real marble buildings um there's a lot uh, they're just much more colorful in their shadows because it's not like plastic it's not opaque not just normal stone mm -hmm. if you have marble that's like thin enough you shine a light behind it it'll be translucent the same way that human fleshes yeah find a light on your finger it starts glowing right man so did you sight size this one i mean this I think so yeah i think so okay i had it up where i was able to use sight size and i don't think i was using it most of the time but i had it where i could plop my head into sight size and when you're working in sight size it's the fastest way to just nail your proportions right that's why i sudden, asked yeah like it's it's night and day if you can use sight size for a really complex subject like all these like really little drawing things that could be really hard to figure it all out. They just all just go and. Yeah. And it obviously you're using it loosely cause you don't, you're not hanging a plumb line. You're not, I mean, yeah, it's, oh. it's pretty loose. Yeah. Like I'm not sight sizing it like a, they would have us do in school. And I, I really don't sight size much at all. Um, and I noticed that sight size, I'd have a mental shift when I would work in sight size where, uh, I eventually just stopped drawing in sight size a lot because when you are drawing in sight size, uh, you're not actually drawing in the sense that you're looking at what it, what's actually out there and you're trying to understand it and comprehend it and translate it. Like you're not trying to, you can't, you don't feel the perspective in the same way. You don't feel the different planes or you don't see the rhythms and gestures. What sight size basically is, is it's a little trick where you can set it up in the same size and line it up and you can just flick your eyes back and forth and the mistakes sort of pop out. But, uh, it, it actually, I don't, yeah, I don't like sight sizing that much, but right. for really complex subject matter, it makes things a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, because this one, being that it's architecture and it's so specific, uh, I mean, the details have to be so correct and precise. If the, if you're out there for ten minutes, the light's going to change a ton for for a subject this specific so yeah. how do you handle that this this was a two-day painting two days so for how much time each day i think about two hours each day okay maybe a bit more okay it was early in the morning uh we got there a, a friend of mine was painting the scene from just a little bit down the road painting sort of the entire facade i sort of just like shouldered my way in down to the pit 
uh, and sort of stood off to the side where it wasn't that busy and it was earlier in the morning. So there weren't that many people early in the morning. Uh, the sun was just starting to rise like on the head. And so uh, it's a matter of balancing what information can you work on at what stage? Right. So, so right. Like all of the foreground is in shadow. Like, that's stuff I could easily work on uh, at the beginning before the light is in a place where I sort of want it. And just sort of looking at it, I had an idea, okay, this would probably look really cool with only a little bit of light on the figure, not like full light, but just having mostly the painting in shadow with a little bit of light would make it an interesting composition. And then I had like my main element, like that statue's sort of facing to the left. So I put it on the right. I made more space. I made sure nothing was like dead center. And so like the compositional choices were pretty straightforward. Okay, well, you want to sort of put things off to the side, figure out a, like a placement. And the light and the shadow pattern was uh, interesting enough. And so, uh, you know, generic drawing, I... I'm pretty sure because I have a reel of how I was painting this mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I did any pencil drawing on it, or if I did, it was really small. Uh, sometimes for sometimes I do a pencil drawing for maybe the first five ten minutes, but I rarely do really detailed pencil drawings. Okay. And. Uh, so I think I just like went in with my brush and I started drawing the placement and some of the details and I started working out the areas which I knew were going to be fairly consistent or now I, well, I think what I did is I started doing the foreground because I knew eventually the shadows are going to change and that's all going to be lit. Right. Uh, things like the lights in the columns, the background, like that stuff was pretty simple, straightforward. Wet and uh, as the sun started coming on the central figure, uh, you could start drawing in the head, you can start drawing in the torso and the arm. And when you can keep working the color throughout, but when it comes to that little point that you decide, okay, that's my point, that's when you make that simple drawing decision of, okay, this is going to be the contour between the light and the shadow. And mm -hmm. all the while, you're uh, strategizing to work on other things. Like, oh, okay, I could I could work relatively uh, stably on that foreground because most of that's in shadow. And then on the second day, I got lucky because it was a bit more overcast than the first day. And so there were, uh, it was, uh, there was actually, it was just more overcast and more stable throughout the second session. But you don't want, why would you want it overcast though when you want these hard shadows like this from his arm? Was that, isn't that going to make it harder? Um, Not harder as in harder shadows, but more difficult? Well, if when it was overcast, when there wasn't any light in the shadow, that meant I could work out the details of the foreground pretty well. Because uh, the foreground, it's basically, it like the entire scene is basically overcast. And when the sun comes out, that light part lights up. And when it's not out there, well, then it's just the rest. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So you only needed a short amount of time at that magic moment just to hit these key light areas. But the whole rest of the painting is essentially an overcast painting because it's, you know, it's the sun isn't hitting it directly. Yeah. And it's not really that detailed of a painting. Like, no, it's very loose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous though. Okay, I know you got to go. We've only got 15 minutes. So let me just go back to this one real quick. And I'm, oh, here we go. So this is it. I wonder if you got, oh, you don't have process shots on this one. No, maybe yeah. I don't have, well, I have a reel if you go far down enough, but then th those things sort of play. And yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Hard to... Well, tell me just about that. I mean, did you lay this one in, in pencil first? This, this one I laid it in pencil. It started as a demo in uh, the workshop I organized in Krakow. Um, and I, I guess I should, I could probably like plug that, uh, I have a mail in these workshops. Yeah. So it's on my website. Uh, you can sign up to, or it's in like my link tree in my bio. 
The so website will be on the show notes. Your website, Instagram will be in the show notes too. Yeah. So Patrick Okra, patrickokrasinski.com. Um, and I just found a bunch of people that wanted to paint with me in Krakow. And so it was awesome. I started this demo by this one. I laid in a pencil drawing because some of the ellipses, some of the perspectives, some of the angles, the way that things relate to each other and making sure the vertical alignments are right. Uh, that was all really important to get, but I don't spend that much time doing that. It's maybe a quick, like, you know, 10 minutes, maybe more if I'm having to explain it in a workshop on my own, maybe five, 10 minutes for a pencil drawing. And I'm not being detailed, but I am being accurate. Right. So when you say perspective so, drawing, you can't actually find the vanishing points precisely because they're way off the canvas. So are you just sort of estimating where these vanishing points are as you make your angles? Um, yeah, basically. The way I do that is I look at a, a lot of uh, negative shapes and the positive shapes. And so, you know, the perspective, you see the perspective in the angles by mm -hmm. all of those lines. And so I'm comparing all the angles and checking if all of those line up with each other. And also you can feel perspective. You can observe what's happening in the scene and try to feel the way that those lines recede. And then in your own painting, you can check if they are receding in the same way, right. or maybe they might be a little too steep or a little too narrow. So, so yeah, it's more of an measure. instinctual perspective drawing. It's not a literal perspective drawing with finding vanishing yeah. points. Yeah. That's kind of been the big pattern that I've observed in myself as I've learned to paint. So, you know, first we draw in a very naive way. Uh, then we can learn, we learn these concepts and we start drawing a bit more analytically. We're looking for shapes. We're looking for measurements, heights, and widths. But uh, the most advanced way that I've gotten to that I've figured out of how you actually paint is like, first you need to learn how to like reduce things into the flat. But then you forget about that and then you try to feel things as they are around in nature and you try to recreate that feeling in your paintings. I don't know if yeah, that's, that's something great. that... That's 100%. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. So like first you think about vanishing points, but eventually you can feel the perspective in the scene and assess, have you captured that same feeling of perspective in your painting? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, man, it's it's disappointing we have to finish here. I know you've got a mentorship, which we should also plug that you're, I guess you mentioned it already, but you are doing this mentorship in case anyone wants to study with you. But the, the final question I have for you is what advice would you give an aspiring painter? The big, like, I wish it was really easy when I got out of school, I got into a gallery and I just, you know, worked with the gallery and sent them paintings and they sent me money but it hasn't been like that. And so I found that, uh, you know, for me personally, it, it, it's a lot of anxiety to try to rely on other people to do things for you. And so, you know, my major arc so far has been finding a way to organize things on my own. You know, I had some amazing experiences like the John of Journey Traveling Fellowship and you know, the residency in France or the Hudson River Fellowship. And those were all really, really helpful, but, um, a lot of what I've been able to do now, why I'm able to travel because I organize these workshops and I sell these paintings at a really affordable prices. I think almost to anyone that's really serious about being an artist nowadays, from my experience, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's possible. And the most almost sure, the surest way that you can actually count on is if you actually heavily focus on social media and do things on your own and focus more on the creative economy kind of thing. And you could do a ton of YouTube and there are a ton of YouTubes about, you know, how to start a channel, like how to like be a creator, how to do these things. I think artists are actually in a really special place where it's a lot easier for artists to be creators and to figure out a living doing that. And that's kind of been my focus for the past year ish year and a half ish almost. And it's been going well. Uh, it's been a lot harder than I thought it was. And so if anyone's very serious about becoming an artist, it's very, very difficult. I think there are, uh, 
there's a lot of opportunity out there that you just have to be creative about to actually do it. And other than that, you know, don't don't be alone. Don't just like try to do it on your own. Go meet other artists because community is also a really big thing. Um, like for me, I saw other people that were doing things that I thought, well, why don't I just do that? Um, like my instructor, Stephen Bauman from Florence Academy, I saw him creating his Patreon. And so now that's one of the things I'm doing. I saw other people do really successful studio sales. So I figured, well, let me just do that. Um, but, you know, being around other artists, like you'll also, your paintings just get better because you're around other artists. But uh, in in like the question of actually like how do you start making things work? Well, you know, if you could be around other artists that are figuring it out, you're going to pick some things up from them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's great advice. I appreciate it. Man, it's been fun to have you on the show. I've been looking forward to this no, for no, a while. Fun. It's it's uh, it, it was a great chat Thank with you. About- yeah, that was like what two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, I know I could have gone another hour, but you're off to a mentorship, so you got to. Uh, yeah, 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 you're spread pretty thin. Mm-hmm. So thanks, man, and uh, I hope to see you again in person sometime. And and of course, I'll never forget you again. So, so <laughs> sorry about the <laughs> portrait society thing. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like, you know, 50 people all painting in that little hallway and, yeah like, oh that's where it was okay i got you the salon, sitting up against the wall maddie was right behind me i think i side. do remember like, you now okay yes i remember now all right well you know i'm only half of an a-hole so anyway i'll never forget you again man i love your work it's it was a huge honor to have you thanks for doing it Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.